All right, good morning. Y'all uh, Y'all make your way in. If you haven't, find a spot. If you're at home, find your way to your couch uh, or wherever you might be. And, and uh, rise with me if you're able. I'm, uh, our call to worship this morning is, is from Isaiah chapter 25. Um, and, and again, I'm, I'm reading this thinking about Advent. And, and thinking about the, as a church, when we celebrate the Advent season, looking back and remembering that Christ came for us, um, and also looking forward it, with the hope and trust that, that he is coming again to make all things new. So this is from Isaiah 25. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the shame of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, um, thank you for being a, a merciful, loving God who chose to leave your throne to come to save us and uh, thank you for being a God who's promised that, that you will complete the good works that you've started in us um, you, you've promised that you are working, that you are always working to, to make all things new um, we, we put our hope and in, in our, in our trust and turn our eyes towards you this morning Jesus and, and away from, from the more fragile places that, that we're prone to put our trust, forgive us for that Lord, we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. While shepherds watch their flocks by night, all seated on the ground, the angels of the Lord came down and glory shone around and glory shone around Fear not said he for mighty dread had seized their troubled mind glad tidings of great joy I bring to you
Esteem Mary, gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. In Bethlehem, in Israel, this blessed babe was born. standing for the reading of the word. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Uh, we're going to read uh, this morning out of the book of Luke, chapter 1, starting in verse 26. So if you would, grab your Bible or call it up on your device and let's read it together. Luke, chapter 1, starting in verse 26. I'm going to read out of the ESV. It says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing is impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. The word of the Lord. Okay. 
let's prepare our hearts for communion together. Let's uh, cry, cry this out together. Come expect a Jesus. And I, uh, especially the last, uh, the last line of this song. By thine all-sufficient merit, raise us to thy glorious throne. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins, release us, let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the saints thou art, dear desire of every nation, joy. Praise forever 
spread till that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who church of Christ was born and the spirit lit the flame and now this gospel truth of old it shall not fail, it shall not faint by his blood and in his name and in his freedom by entry for the love of Jesus Christ who has risen So it's so fitting that we have sung those two songs back to back because we're talking about an incredible paradox that we celebrate at Christmas. Uh, We celebrate every Sunday here in this church, actually. But um, we're talking about the birth of a person who was both king of kings and a sacrificial lamb. This is amazing. When we think about the birth of Christ, we often think about the baby, uh, the life the king of kings aspect of it, where the the wise men brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh, gifts fit for a king to this baby uh, born uh, in a stable in a very lowly place. And we think about that aspect of it, but we, we don't often think about what Jesus did for the rest of his life 
in that he gave it up. I mean, it was a living sacrifice for us, ultimately ending uh, on the cross when he died for us, uh, proving God's love for mankind, for sinful people. Uh, but when we, we think about that, uh, I just it, it's amazing to think about Jesus, for his entire life, he gave up the King of Kings title when he should have been, absolutely. Should have been reigning on a throne somewhere from the time he was a little boy because he had that authority. He is the maker of every single one of us. He is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he deserved to have that, but he gave it up. He gave it up for his entire life here on earth and uh, so that we might have life, so that we might be forgiven, so that we might be in the family of God along with him. And so it's an amazing story as we uh, look at Christmas as just being the beginning of, of Jesus, Jesus' incarnation, God becoming flesh, dwelling among us, living a perfect life. And so it's this morning that we come together, and as we're getting so close to Christmas, we are remembering uh, the birth of Christ, certainly. But every Sunday here at Hill Country Church, we remember the death of Christ being the way of salvation for, for you and for me, for everybody. For he ca came to die. He came to give himself as a sacrifice. Because as the songs say, he is both King of Kings and the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so we remember that uh, as we come together um, each Sunday at this table, uh, the communion table, the Lord's table, we come together and we remember, um, and it, Jesus has done something amazing for us individually. He has certainly given us life and we celebrate that, but he's also brought us together into a family, a family that we call the church. Each of us are from different backgrounds, different places. You have a different mom and dad. But we've been brought together here into this one family under God. We are in the family of God. And he's accepted each and every one of us. And he invites us to this table to remember. And we can go back all the way to the very beginning of the church in the first century when Paul writes to the church in Corinth, beginning in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And in just a moment, we will do that very thing. We will proclaim the Lord's death as we continue in this Advent season to wait for his second coming. But uh, before we do that, I would like for you, just wherever you're sitting, and if you're at home watching with us, take this time uh, to ponder the gift of God in Jesus Christ. That yes, we are celebrating at Christmas the birth of a baby, but it is the birth of our salvation, and it is the birth of, of God coming into this world to save us, to reconcile us to himself. And that is the, that is the beauty of it. And so let's take a moment to ponder that. And if you're carrying with you any burdens this morning, as I am sure many of you are, whatever it is, uh, now's the time to come to him and lay those down. Lay those down in front of him. He will take those away from you. Any unconfessed sin, give those to him. Confess them to him. Um, we are told in Scripture that uh, he is always faithful and just uh, to, to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, to forgive us of our sins if we come confessing them to him. So take this moment, wherever you're sitting, silently between you and God, uh, thinking of these things, confessing, remembering, um, and asking for uh, his blessing on you at this time.
me take this time to remind you that here at Hill Country Church, we observe what we call an open communion. And, and all that means is you do not have to be a member of this particular church family to partake with us. So we ask and invite all believers in the Lord Jesus to share in this time together as we share in this very sacred and holy meal. Um, on that note, if you would uh, look in the pew racks in front of you, uh, you'll find a little juice cup, a prepackaged communion set. Uh, with a wafer on top. If you want to go ahead and pull one of those out, we'll go through this together. And if you do not have one right in front of you, they are stationed all around this room, the windowsills, they're in the back. Um, so I'm sure you can find one. Okay, uh, so let us do this together. And of course, remembering the words of Christ as we do it. And so if you want to peel back the top part, uh, the clear cellophane and pull out the wafer, if I could do this. So at that last supper, um, on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. If you want to peel back the other part. In the same way, also, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, drink this, as often as you do it, in remembrance of me. Would you pray with me? Father God, we come to you this morning, humbled by the gift that you have given us at Christmas. The gift of your son, the king of kings and the lamb of God. Father, we uh, lift up his name high this morning and we remember him. Thank you for giving us this time. You have instituted this time that we may remember each and every week. And so, Father, we thank you for that. But most of all, we thank you for your son who we celebrate this time of year coming into the world so that we might be changed, so that we might be given life. And so, Father, for that, we're eternally grateful. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand with us. We're going to respond to our time in communion with joy to the world. And I learned recently that when Isaac Watts wrote these words, uh, definitely an Advent song, but, but he was imagining Christ's return uh, when, when he wrote these words. And so I um, would just encourage you in that to maybe you know, use your imagination, access the longing in your heart for uh, reuniting with our, with our Jesus who comes to make his blessing flow as far as the curse is found. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. Blessings flow far as the curse. 
curses found, far as the curses found, far as, far as the curses found. And He rules the world with truth and grace, and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness and wonders of His love and wonders of His love and wonders, wonders of His love. Joy, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let us Now I'm on the, in the Christmas spirit. Thanks, you guys. Today is the 20th of December. Wow. A um, couple of announcements here real quick. These are in your, all of these are in your bulletin except for one. So I'm just going to run through these real quick just to have the heads up. Number one, January 31st at 5 o'clock in the afternoon or in the evening, the Women's uh, Fellowship will have their soup supper, the Bloom Fellowship. Two, if you're interested in serving on the flower committee, Rhoda Reynolds is your point of contact and reach out to her. Three, we are still filling up the 40-foot Connex that we talked about uh, the last couple of weeks uh, for the Bread of Life ministry in Cameroon. So they're still looking for computers, iPads, cell phones, dry erase markers, plumbing, fixtures, tillers, and assortment of other things. And so if you have that laying around, um, uh, Jerry Hominick's your guy. Please reach out to him. This one's not in your bulletin. Um, it's pretty full in here. It's such a weird time because COVID's up, COVID's down, but there's a lot of people here. So praise the Lord for that. But, uh, and so therefore, we're going to continue uh, providing uh, a ministry to your children. We just need some help. <laughs> um, so Allie has provided a sign-up sheet in the back. So uh, as we're ramping up and continuing to uh, minister to the children of this church we just need help would you sign up please uh, not in the back I'm sorry out there in the uh, in the foyer um, if you're watching online and you want to sign up by just reaching out to Allie her email address is Allie A-L-L-I-E A-L-L-I-E at hccfpg.org okay and then uh, also don't forget Thursday is Christmas Eve, and we're doing a service at 5.30 here. It's a beautiful, meaningful candlelight service, and I hope you'll all attend. We'll also have some kind of overflow, if you will, in the Here Holster Hall in that area. So mark your calendars if you're here, 5.30, Thursday night, Christmas Eve service. Okay. Let's pray together as a family. Father God, we, we come before you with hearts of gratitude in this Christmas season. 
we know, Lord, that there is one way to God, and you provided that way. We can never live up to your standard, and so your son has come and done that for us. And that is a free gift that we receive. And so our only response is gratitude and thankfulness for, for your son and, and for what you have provided. Um, and in this Christmas season, Lord, I pray that you would increase that gratitude and that response that we would serve you well in the things that we do and the things that we say and the things that we think. Father God, we, we also come asking for physical healing and restoration. Many of us in this congregation endure kind of daily challenges and struggles. Some of us endure great daily struggles that are distracting and painful. And I ask, Lord, for, for peace, comfort, healing, endurance, encouragement. Um, Lord, I lift specifically up Lauren Buckhorn. I lift up Charlotte Allison, who is waiting to hear on a, an important surgery. I lift up my brother Larry. I'm grateful, Father, that, uh, that you are a healer and that you do heal and that you do provide comfort and encouragement, and we pray for that. Um, Lord, I pray for um, safety during this time of, of the coronavirus. Lord, I pray for your supernatural intervention as vaccines and herd immunity and all the things that are coming down the pipe. Lord, I pray that our eyes would stay focused on you and that you would produce fruit in us, primarily the fruit of love, because for some reason this pandemic has caused massive disunity and I pray as a congregation, as a people, as a follower of Jesus Christ, that your fruit would abound in us, that we would love and we would unify and we would uh, work to bring you honor. And that's really what we're doing. We prone to, I, I am prone to wonder, anger, frustration, envy, apathy, all of these set in. And Lord, I pray that you would just work in our lives, drive us to your word daily that we would have effective ministry for you. Our goal is to glorify you, and I pray that you would give us the strength and the encouragement to do that. Lord, I lift up our missionaries during this time. Um, Christmas season, away from home typically, and especially in what's going on in this current moment, I pray for their effective ministries. I pray for peace and comfort in their life. I pray for the ministries of this church as we, as we navigate how to, um, how, to, how to serve you and serve your people. Lord, I pray for encouragement. And ultimately, I pray for an awakening. I pray that you would awaken all of our hearts. I pray that this season would be a catalyst, that our hearts would be awakened, that we would pursue you, that we would know you, that we would serve you, that we would honor you in what we think and what we say and what we do. Our hearts are eternally grateful, Father. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pete. Um, let me just add to that uh, announcement that um, the Christmas Eve service, we will also be live streaming that. So if you've got family in town and you don't want to bring them in, I understand this thing will be live streamed. And you can also, I encourage you to uh, send that link to other people. I'll be sending the link out or later this week. Uh, but if you want people in another town, perhaps, to uh, join in with us on Christmas Eve, that would be wonderful. So I uh, just want to throw that out there, that that's another option that you have on uh, Christmas Eve. So uh, if you have your Bible with you this morning, I invite you to turn with me to the letter of First John. Surprise, surprise, we're back there. Uh, we're actually in the same passage we were in last week. 1 John chapter 4, verses 13 through 21. And uh, if you want to borrow a, a pew Bible in the rack in front of you there, you're welcome to do that. The, the black Bibles in front of you, you can find this passage beginning on page 1023, 1023. So uh, if you want to take one of those, that's great. And I'm going to begin this morning a little differently than I typically do, but I'd like to just read this passage and uh, let, it, uh, let it sink in as, we, as we're talking along here. But I also uh, would want you to keep your finger in that passage so, so you know uh, we're going to be referring back to it as we go along today. So let me go ahead and just read this, and then we will go from there. 1 John 4, 13 uh, says something like this. 
By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe that the love that God has for us, God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has, whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have, have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. And so, what in the world does this have to do with Christmas, you might be asking. And uh, as I mentioned last week, <clears throat> it has a lot to do with it, at least if you ask me. Why? Because it speaks of a gift, a multifaceted gift. The perfect gift, in fact, that was given, uh, that is given at Christmas, the gift of love, the gift of Jesus Christ, the gift of God himself. And yes, it's what we celebrate this time of year. We, we generally, when we, when we think about Christmas, we think about the story from Luke 2 or perhaps Matthew's, Matthew chapters 1 and 2, where we read about, about the birth of Christ in Bethlehem. Uh, born to a poor young Jewish girl, and since there was no room at the end, she had to give birth and spend the first night in a stable. You remember the story with the animals? Laying the baby in a manger, a feeding trough, because that's all they had for, for a bed. And yes, the story is, is so wonderful. We're going to remember and celebrate and proclaim that story on Christmas Eve when we gather here. But, but last week and today, we're looking at another passage, one that isn't normally associated with Christmas, because it speaks of the gift that was given that night. The greatest gift any of us will ever receive, the, the greatest gift we could ever receive, and the passage we just read, I hope you saw this, is filled with the theme of being given something, a gift. A Christmas gift. Look back at it. He has given us of his spirit, verse 13. The Father has sent his Son as a gift to be the Savior of the world, verse 14. God abides in us and we in God. In other words, a lasting, abiding relationship was given as a gift, verse 15. He sent or he gave his Son as a gift to be the propitiation for our sins, verse 16. And then, and then there's a lot about love written in this passage and in the remaining verses, love is perfected in us, is what it says. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. We love because he first loved us, and on it goes. This is really the book of love, First John. If God is love, which we have read multiple times in this book, then the gift of God in the flesh, the person of Jesus Christ, is the gift of love. God came wrapped our love came wrapped up in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger at Christmas. That's how we must look at this scene. It's so much more than what we can see in a painting, perhaps a depiction of a, a nativity scene, or even when we ponder the miracle of the infant Christ himself, because his birth represents God's loving and gracious, incredible and sacrificial offering for us. So that, we would, so that we would no longer be in rebellion. So that we would no longer be dead in our sins. So that we might have all these things spoken of in, in our passage today. Not the we, least of which is love. And we really need love. Let's face it. Like I said, the gift of Jesus is the greatest gift you or I will ever know about or receive. For he is the perfect gift. When I think about Christmas gifts, there's some things that come to mind. Some actions on our part that need to be considered. I asked the question last week, what do you do with the perfect gift? And that's what we need to consider. 
And, and from last time, we must first acknowledge the gift. It means that we have to know that it happened. The son was given. He was born. He lived as a man. There was a gift of infinite value given that night in Bethlehem. And with him came all of these wonderful things given to a bunch of people who deserved none of it. So just like you see gifts under the tree at Christmas, you acknowledge that, that they're there. They exist. Someone took the time to pick them out, to wrap them, put your name on them. To deny their existence is simply foolish, but I suppose some people might try because they, they try all the time to deny the existence of the perfect Christmas gift, acting as if it never really happened and that it's all a figment of someone's imagination, relegating the birth of Christ to the scrap heap of historical myths. But this is no myth. This is no myth. God's Son came to us at Christmas. There is a gift, a gift with our name on it, a gift not of monetary value, wasn't purchased at a store, but it is of infinite value, a gift that keeps on giving. So we must first acknowledge the gift, then we must receive the gift. As you know, in order to enjoy a present or even uh, open it, you must first receive it. You must Take it, take possession of it, acknowledge it, and then actually appropriate it. it, it it's yours, right? If it's your gift, so act like it, take hold of it, receive it. Everything that the gift is that we talked about last week, we have seen in this passage, it remains unopened and unappreciated and really unknown if we don't receive it. But if, but if it's in the receiving, it's in the receiving where we can know the fullness of of God's love. Jesus came to save and he came to give life, but he must be received. It's not enough just to know all the facts about him or believe that he came to this earth or that he performed miracles or even that he died for sinful human beings. It's not enough to know. For it says in James 2:19, "You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you." Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. The gift must be received. John himself in his gospel, chapter 1 and verse 12 says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And so when we receive him, that's, when, that's what we become. We become his children. Our hands, our hands need to be out and ready to receive what he has brought to us at Christmas. We don't do anything to, to earn the perfect gift. But we must bring open hands to the gift giver. So when we come, we come to him, we come with our hands empty, open to God. And he gives us this incredible gift. The gift of his son, which we celebrate at Christmas. But then what is the best part about receiving a gift? It's opening it. I think of the many Christmas mornings I, I woke up and, and I ran into the living room and, and saw the gifts wrapped under the tree. Those moments, are, they're etched into my mind. And so with my own kids, the same thing happens. Some of my favorite memories are watching them do the same thing. And they are, they are so excited. They kind of hide just outside the room uh, until mom and dad have their coffee that's kind of how we roll at the Holster household. They're not allowed to open their presents uh, until we're all gathered around. We're all there, and, and Mama and I have our coffee, right? That's the order of events. But then how crazy would it be? Put yourself in that situation. How crazy would it be if we just sat there and we looked at the presents? Admiring the wrapping paper and the bows and not opening them. That'd be crazy. And there's no way kids would ever allow that to happen, by the way. At some point, they're going to tear into them because opening the gift is perhaps the best part. Mysteries are solved. Anticipation gives way to exuberance. Discoveries are made. You don't know what you've got until you open the package and you experience what's inside. The same is true with the perfect gift. We've got to open it. 
for it's in opening the gift that we discover all that God has given us. Again, it's not just a baby in a manger. He means so much more. He has so much to give us. He has so much to share with us. Going back to our passage in 1 John, if you take a look back at verse 16, it says, So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. It says that we have come to know and to believe, and we only come to know and believe by way of opening the gift. It's not revealed or realized any other way. God doesn't force it on us, and, and, and we wouldn't understand his love for us otherwise. The knowledge and belief and experience of God's love is still a mystery if we don't open the gift. Because it is revealed as we unpack all that God has freely given us. In fact, all of those things mentioned in verse 13 and following are only truly discovered and experienced when we open the gift, the indwelling and counsel of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 13, that's part of it. The fullness of salvation. It's not, ju it's not just fire insurance. Salvation, sometimes we can think of it that way. A, a get out of hell free card, maybe you look at it like that. There, there's more complexity, there is more fullness to this term salvation. There's a strange passage, by the way, as a side note in Philippians, uh, written by Paul, that speaks to this idea. He says in Philippians 2, 12, and 13, it says this, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but more in my absence, work out your own salvation. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, when we read that, some people might wrongly interpret working out your salvation as, as working hard to earn your salvation, as if that's what Paul is saying. That's not what Paul's saying. All of Paul's teaching and writing would go against that. But that's, so that's not what he's saying. He's saying, Open the gift. Open the gift of salvation. There is more to it. See and understand what is there. There's so much more than just escaping the fires of hell. There's a quality of life to enjoy that goes with it. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. In other words, there's more work God wants to do in your life than to simply make sure that you go to heaven. and You're, you're good with that. Salvation is a gift that needs to be opened and discovered and experienced, which I'll talk about later, that part. Then there's uh, the abiding relationship as we continue going through our passage. Again, with, with the reception of the gift, the invitation is there for this abiding relationship. But how do we respond? There's a great uh, but also misunderstood passage in the book of Revelation uh, go figure, there's a lot we don't understand about the book of Revelation, right? But, but we can understand this one. This is one of those few that uh, is, I think, pretty straightforward. Revelation 3.20. Revelation 3.20. Jesus says to the church, um, now this is believers, right? Those who have received Christ. Uh, he says to the church at Laodicea, a particular church, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door... I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. This is about opening the abiding relationship given to us in the person of Jesus Christ. He's giving those who believe an invitation. For he's even standing at, at our door and he's knocking. If we hear him and we open the door, he promises to, to come in and have fellowship with us. He wants to remain in us, and he wants us to remain in him. With the perfect Christmas gift, there is an invitation to open the door of our, of our innermost self and then have the opportunity to share in the life of Jesus. He'll come in and, and share a meal with us, it says. That comes when we open the gift, when we, when we open the door. When we open the gift, we are opening up our heart to a love that is not humanly possible, this love is perfected in us when we open it. If we leave the gift unopened and just sitting there, we will miss the opportunity. 
and we won't be able to love others. We won't be able to love others with the love that should be inside each one of us. We are commanded by John once again at the end of our passage today, verse 21, to love one another. He says, and this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must love his brother. This is a theme, obviously, as we've been going through this book. But let me just say, and and probably you know this from experience, it doesn't just happen. It doesn't come naturally. Yet we can't even love God well. We can't love our, our most loved people well. So how are we to love others, strangers, people we don't like? people that are different than us. We must open the gift of love that we have been given at Christmas. Opening the gift is certainly a blessing in itself. And it's not until we open the perfect Christmas gift that we can truly experience the authentic Christian life that we were created to live. The joy, the peace, the victory, all that comes with it. But then there is yet another step we need to take after opening the gift. We need to use the gift, or perhaps enjoy the gift, experience it, since it's something that is is done inside of us. If there's one thing that disappoints me on Christmas, it's when my kids, or anyone for that matter, opens a gift that I really put a lot of thought into, and my anticipation is running high. I can't wait to give it to them. I can't wait for them to open it. But then they open the gift, and they set it aside, put it on the shelf, collects dust in their bedroom, that kind of thing. That's such a letdown when we do that. We don't give gifts so that people can keep them in the packaging. We give gifts so that people will use them. They will enjoy them. I've told you about my struggles uh, in buying Michelle gifts at Christmas and how I don't like buying clothes. This is why. Because of my fear that she'll wear it once and then she'll hang it in the closet for eternity. I, I want her to wear it, right? If I've thought about it, I've done this, I want her to wear it. When I buy my kids toys or games or whatever it is, I want them used, played, worn out. You know, my daughter, Sydney, uh, was given uh, a, a yellow blanket when she was just a baby. You know, kids, babies get all kinds of gifts, and that was one of them. So she doesn't remember getting it. I don't remember who gave it to her. It was just one of those things. But she loves that blanket. She has slept with it every night for her, literally her entire life. Uh, she even took it to college with her. And, and believe me, that thing is in tatters. It, is, uh, it has holes in it. It looks dirty, but I'm afraid to wash it because, you know, it might fall apart in there. Uh, it's literally falling to pieces. But it is beloved. It is used. It is an experienced gift. When we were packing, up, uh, packing her up for college, I remember I saw that thing for the first time. She always just keeps it in her bed, but I saw that thing for the first time in years, and, and I couldn't believe it. A, that she still had it, but B, that it was still you know, able to be in one piece. It looked, it looked terrible. But of course, she picked it up, and she folded it up neatly, and she packed it up with the rest of her bedding like it was the most important thing in the world, like she was not going to college without that blanket. That's how you use and enjoy a gift. That's what we want uh, whenever we give someone something special. We want them to wear it out because they love it so much and they get so much enjoyment out of it. The same is true for the perfect Christmas gift. So we have received it and we have opened it, but are we using it? Are we enjoying it? Are we living in him and allowing him to live in us? Looking at our passage again, are we experiencing the Holy Spirit working within us from verse 13? Are we working out our salvation which was given to us from verse 14? Are we abiding in him? Verse 15. Jesus said in John chapter 15, his gospel John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. So if we are abiding if we are experiencing the branch life connected to the vine, then we will be producing fruit which is highly desired. Bearing fruit comes from using the gift, 
It comes from using the gift, from experiencing the gift. And of course, we, then we have love as we continue in our passage today. We have love, perfect love. Perfect love, which has come to us in the person of Jesus Christ, the gift of love. We need it. We need this love. And we need to use this love. It's also not to be put on a shelf. To love one another, as John talks about in our passage so many times. But another application of this love is to drive out fear. Verse 18. Verse 18 says this, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Now to be accurate, he's speaking of the fear of judgment. And yes, when we receive this love and open this love and experience this love, we should not fear the judgment of God. For it is not going to be there for us. Romans 8.1 says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And so that's a wonderful thing. There is no fear of the judgment of God when we are in Christ, when we have been given the gift and we open it, we receive it. So we should not fear the judgment that is to come, but we should have, we should have confidence instead, according to verse 17, because God's love has been perfected in us. If it's being used, this is, this is how, it, how it gets used. It becomes perfected. But when we live in God's love, we should not fear anything. It's not just ju the judgment that is to come. I mean, that's probably the greatest thing any of us should ever fear. But when we live in God's love and it is perfected in us, we should fear nothing. And now is a, is a really good time to start thinking about that. There's a, there's a lot to be afraid of in the world today. Nobody knows, nobody knows how this COVID-19 thing is going to play out. And there's a, a lot of uncertainty. The world is pushing fear really hard right now. I don't know if you've noticed that. The world is pushing fear. If you read and you listen to the news, you'll find all kinds of new things that you didn't even know you had to worry about. Now you've got to worry about them. But that's not the way it should be. That's not the way it should be when we have been given the perfect Christmas gift. We should not live in fear. Why? Because the perfect gift, the perfect love that we've been given to receive, to open, and to use, it drives out fear. There is no fear in love, is what it says. Perhaps this Christmas is the time to start living like that's true. Confidence is another gift that we have in Christ, and we need to use it. We need to enjoy it. So there's acknowledging the gift, receiving the gift, opening the gift, and using the gift. All are vital steps in the answer to what do you do with the perfect Christmas gift. But there's one more thing I'd like to add. We need to keep the gift. We need to keep the gift. Now this should go without saying, but another unfortunate reality in uh, the Christmas gift-giving season, is that people don't keep them. They do the dreaded return. That's a real slap in the face. People don't, people don't really return the gift of God in Jesus Christ per se. That's impossible, actually. But they do exchange the gift. They do exchange the gift. They don't keep it. Somehow they come to the conclusion that there is something better out there that I can exchange this for, something that will satisfy them more than Jesus. There are those who, who take the gift back, so to speak, and they exchange the truth of God for a lie. As Paul writes in Romans 1, chapter 1, verse 25, they worship and serve the things, of, uh, the things God created instead of the Creator Himself. There are different ways people do this, uh, and I could go on. I'm not going to get into all of that this morning. But just understand that perhaps the most valuable part of the perfect gift is in keeping it. Is in keeping it. Remaining in Him and allowing Him to remain in you at all times, all throughout the years of your life. Jesus didn't come as a gift to be enjoyed only for a short time. He came that we may have life and have it abundantly all the days of our life. And in going back to John's gospel, chapter 15, verse 4, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. 
For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Focus on that word, remain. Keep and relish and delight in the gift every day for the rest of your life. The perfect gift is like that. Christmas is a time when we remember it. We remember the gift, of course, but it should not be the only time that we remember it. We need to keep the gift, and by keeping it, I I mean we keep it close to our hearts. We keep it there to let it remain in us, for He is in us. And there is nothing in the world worth exchanging Him for. Nothing could come close. Let us receive the gift, open it, experience it, and keep it all over again this Christmas. So I say Merry Christmas to you all, and may God bless you. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for the perfect gift that you gave us at Christmas, your son Jesus, the King of Kings and the sacrificial lamb. Father, we are humbled by the gift. Now, Father, as we go forth from here, let us not only receive it, but let us put it to use. Let us remember and keep it and cherish it, Father, as if it's the most valuable thing in the world, because it is. And so, Father, help us uh, to do that as we leave here today, and let, let this Christmas be the starting point for us, that we would go forward into the new year, into 2021, determined to use the gift that you've given us to live in it. As you have taught us to love, you have given us love that can be given to others. Father, help us to do all those things. And Father, we thank you that although we didn't deserve it, your son has come and he's given us a multifaceted gift that we could never even imagine. And so, Father, we we thank you for that. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Rob. Let's stand and sing the doxology and sing it like you mean it, which I hope you do. Praise God from whom all blessing Listen to these words that Paul wrote to Timothy. It says in 1 Timothy, it says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, sorry, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, to be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Merry Christmas.